then let's uh, begin with the word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new unto us every morning. And though we have not deserved your goodness, you still abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Better. Okay. So we're, we're looking at our outline. We're going to be talking, we're in this section here about B, second arguments about uh, receiving justification, how one becomes an heir. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about today the end of the law's function as guardian, the coming of the inheritance by faith. So we're, we're in this discussion about law, uh, the law of God, and then we're also going to be talking about the gospel. And I actually have a little bit of, um, I don't want to say a detour, uh, but a little off-topic concept just to hit one particular point uh, when we get to it uh, about the third use of the law. And that's something that as Lutherans, we're, it's, it's kind of unique to us, even though some other denominations will bring in some aspects of it. But I think it's really Lutherans that really have done a very good job in hammering that out. And we're going to be talking about that. But um, Paul is going to be introducing the concept the law was the guardian, okay? That is something that keeps tabs of us, something that guards us, protects us, almost like a parent as a, a child is growing up. And then when the child comes of age, guess what? Do you still need parents to be micromanaging your lives? And, you know, that's where sometimes the tension comes in around junior high and high school as we want more independence and mom and dad are saying, no, no, you still need more guardian than this, okay? But eventually you get to that point of being independent on your own. Maybe, maybe. Still hoping for that for, my, for uh, at least uh, one of my daughters here, but that's a different story. But anyway, let's uh, move on here. And so now let's, uh, so we're at Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, un imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Now I will admit, we kind of have to watch our definitions here. Because when we think of faith, our first reaction is, faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and fair enough, that's exactly what I want you to be thinking in. Paul's going to use this in a little bit of a different uh, thing here. Uh, so what he, he is going to refer to faith, and it is directed toward Jesus Christ, but now he's going to use that as when Jesus came. Okay, So I do want you to see that word faith pointing to Jesus, okay? And our faith does indeed point to Jesus. But when Paul is using it here, he's actually kind of referring to what Jesus did on the cross, okay? And so now before Jesus completed our salvation on Calvary's cross, maybe that's a better way of describing it, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned, until the coming faith would be revealed. So uh, I want you to basically think of before faith came, okay, before Jesus came, uh, you, you have this period of time from Moses to Christ, okay? Moses when the law was given, and then Christ when Christ fulfills the law. And so I want you to think of that little time period, okay? And did I confuse anyone yet? Don't worry, it's coming. Oh, John? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what you mean by receiving justification. I think you partially revealed the meaning of it right now. But I think it's more complicated than that. Uh, believe me, the, this section, this is one, one of the reasons why I want to go slowly, because like you said, it's very, it gets very complicated. And part of it is, and I, I will admit when we get to uh, we have to kind of watch how words are being used. We are very often, uh, we're used to a word meaning one thing. 
and we get really uncomfortable when a word means one thing in this situation and then something else in another situation. And we're going to get to that articulated a little bit more when we get to the whole concept of what is the law. Okay. And uh, we again, you have to spend the time to hammer it out. And then the next thing is we're always going to be looking at how scripture interprets scripture and how that scripture is used in context with the setting. So just keep this in mind. Uh, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. And then let's go to verse 24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. So now St. Paul kind of starts hammering this out a little bit more in order that we might be justified by faith. So notice the direction here that St. Paul is pointing us. You have the law. The law is going to be our guardian, okay, until Christ comes for the purpose, you could say, of pointing us to that we are saved by God's grace through faith, that justification uh, by faith. Now, I brought in two aspects from, or two uh, ideas from uh, the small catechism. Uh, and we call this the active obedience of Jesus and the passive obedience of Jesus. That A, Jesus fulfilled our obligation to keep the law. Okay, so we'll talk about Jesus fulfilling the law perfectly. Okay. And then they, we call that the act of obedience. Okay. Uh, he fulfilled the will of God perfectly. And so far, or keeping the law perfectly. And then B, uh, Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sin. We call that his passive obedience. So notice that these obediences is obedience to the Father's will. Uh, the Father wants you to be without sin. We can't be without sin. Jesus was without sin. He fulfilled the law perfectly. And he suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sin. Uh, and again, fulfilling uh, God's uh, will. So Christ's fulfillment of the law, as you could say, it was a substitute for us. Because we couldn't do it. And so we, we hang on to the, what Christ did and say, this is our salvation. I couldn't do it, so Christ did it for me. So the law was our guardian, okay? And the law was there to show us God's will and to show us our need for a savior because we can't do it. So Christ now comes, as St. Paul says in verse 24, so that we put our faith and trust in Christ. And that's how we are saved. Now notice something else about this. I'm using the law of God previously. We're talking about salvation here in verse 24. We're talking about how one becomes a child of God. How one gets eternal life. Okay, We are saved by God's grace through faith. Uh, before, the law was our guardian. Christ came to come, came, comes to fulfill the law, and we are saved by putting our faith and trust in what Christ has accomplished. Any questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I was just wondering, before Christ was born, people were told that our Savior is coming. Right. Didn't they have faith then? Right. They were to put their faith and trust in that coming Savior. Correct. Okay, and the law was given because you got to remember, and this is what we covered last week, and thank you for reminding me of that because I probably should have put that more into the introduction here. Because last week we talked about what happened before Moses gave the law. You have a whole here period of history before that. And then you go back to that Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 passage, which you know I get a lot of mileage out of where you have the promise of Christ being given. And Adam and Eve were to put their, prom their faith and trust in God keeping those promises. But last week we talked about then why did God give us the law? 
because of our, our sin, our constantly disobeying what God wants and going a different direction. And so the law was there as that little guardian that says, don't go this wrong direction. Instead, continue to put your faith and trust in Christ. And very often we sit there and say, well, how, why, and so forth. We ask those type of questions. And that's where these Ten Commandments came in. Here, worship God, follow him, trust his promises. Oh, uh, you know, enjoy your family, don't steal, you know, don't kill, you know, don't covet. You know, you, you get all these uh, commandments from God and that's designed to keep our focus upon the promises of God. But the, the, word, the, the role of the law, okay, uh, for, uh, was that of a guardian until Christ came. Yes? You brought something up in my mind. The meaning of obedience has a, has a background to it. And the fact that without discipline, there is no obedience. The mind itself must be disciplined by something. And that something is... Ooh, and how does God discipline us? That's one of my favorite questions to kind of ask is, you know, have you ever said, okay, Lord, increase my faith? How does the Lord increase your faith? By giving you many challenges and then Ooh. you have to lean on him. By giving you challenges so that you return back to God's word, right? So we're saying, okay, Lord, challenge me, right? So you're saying, John, discipline me. Oh, I, I don't know about you, but that, at that point I'm sitting there going, uh oh, I'm now in trouble here. Be careful what you ask for. But, but that's a difficult thing when we're talking about God. Discipline. You're right, but I love what Scripture says. God disciplines those he loves. But we sit there and go, I want the easy road. I don't want the tough road. But God says, I will help you through the tough road. That's the joy. Even though we don't like to go down those tough roads, but then again, we're not going down it alone. And that's what we need to realize, and that also increases our faith and trust in Christ. So all those challenges you have in life, they help strengthen your faith and trust in Christ. Military type celebration. And yep, today is Veterans Day. Yep. And that's the basis for military is discipline. And you're right, that's the basis of the military for discipline. And yes, I've already sent my daughter a text that said Happy Veterans Day. <laughs> so, uh, but okay, let, let's, uh, anyway, okay, so let's move on. Uh, 25, 26. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Okay, so notice the, the issue here, and I like to talk about justification and sanctification as two separate things. Justification is how we are connected to God. We are connected to God by God's grace through faith. And then we're going to talk a little bit later about sanctification. After we are connected to God, how do we live that Christian life uh, in connection with God. And so those are two different things. So here again, St. Paul is talking on the grounds of justification. Now I want to bring in Luther here for a moment here. Okay, Luther has this. He says, that is, we are free from the law, our prison and custodian, for after faith has been revealed, it no longer terrifies and troubles us. Paul he is speaking here about faith uh, promulgated through Christ at a specific time. For having assumed human nature, Christ came once for all at one time, abrogated the law with all its effects, and by his death delivered the entire human race from sin and eternal death. So Christ fulfilled the law. Okay. So now comes the question that's probably stirring in the back of your mind. Is the law still in effect? 
yes or no? Yes. Christ came once for all at the at one time, abrogated the law with all its effects by his death and delivered the entire human race from sin and eternal death. Don't worry, this is one of those debates that really took a lot of hammering out here. So, but let's begin some of this hammering out because I think it's a good thing for us to do. And so let's start with Jesus, the words of Jesus, as Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. How could you be least and more and not enter the kingdom of heaven? It seems to me that you've got both there, according to that statement. You have both what? Least and not least. Oh, okay. Oh, so, uh, uh, yes. And so now we have to ask ourselves, what is, what is Jesus talking about here when he says, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, there's that challenge. Can you fulfill the law perfectly? No. And that's the place that Jesus wants you to be. So when we look at the law of God, that's why he says, can you exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? And the answer should be no. Okay. And Jesus is saying, I'm not taking away the law. Okay? It's still there. You need to be perfect. And you sit there and go, I can't be. And it's going to put you in a situation where you've got to come to the conclusion, you need a Savior. And what is that Savior going to do? Fulfill the law perfectly. Not kick out the Romans. Okay, that's what a lot of the, the religious leaders were thinking that the Savior would do. But fulfill the law perfectly because you cannot. Okay, that's, your, that's what our Savior does. So Christ uh, fulfilled the law. We cannot. Uh, faith uh, means basically being uh, uh, children of God. Uh, the law is... Uh, in effect, until all is accomplished? That's a good debate. When is all accomplished? It is finished. Until we're in heaven. It is finished. Or until we're in heaven. Last day. Hmm. When Christ died on the cross. When Christ died on the cross and he accomplished everything. Does that mean we toss out the law? Or does that mean the law is no longer our guardian? It's not our guardian. Ah, okay. We still know the law is there for. And, and that's the point that St. Paul wants to make. And hang on to that tension here because you're like, okay, it's, it's fulfilled in Christ on, when he dies on the cross, but yet we still need the law. Good. I'm glad you're feeling that tension. And I'm glad you're sitting there going, Pastor, I'm a little confused right now because now let's go to what as Lutherans we call the third use of the law. I'm actually quoting here from our Book of Concord, from the uh, Formula of Concord, the Epitome, 
Uh, we have two sections of the Formula Concord. You could say the Reader's Digest version and the more expanded version. This is the Reader Digest version, but still, same Formula Concord. Uh, Article 6 concerning uh, third use of the law. And the point number one, the law has been given to people for three reasons. First, that through it, uh, external discipline may be maintained against the unruly and the disobedient. Okay, so the first purpose of the law was uh, for external discipline. We, we call that like a curb. We, we teach it that way in the small catechism. Second, that people may be led through it uh, to a recognition of their sin. And so that second use is that of a mirror. When you look in a mirror, you see yourself. And that's again, is the purpose of the law. Third, this is the point we're going to get to. After they have been reborn, okay, that means after you're a Christian, you've been justified, okay, by God's grace through faith, you believe and trust in Christ. After you've been reborn, since nevertheless the, si the flesh still clings to them, okay, basically we're still sinners, okay, we still struggle with that original sin. Uh, we still struggle with sin while we're still the side of uh, paradise. So nevertheless, uh, the flesh still clings to them that precisely because of the flesh, they may have a sure guide according to which they can orient and conduct their entire life. Okay, so basically the third use of the law is that as Christians, uh, we are redeemed by Christ, okay? He fulfilled the law perfectly, but we don't toss away the law. We hang on to the law as a guide for our daily living. As a guide, not a guardian. Okay. So, when you grew up in your parents' household, did you have to follow the rules? Or else, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when you get your own place? Make your own rules. You get to make your own rules! Yeah! Exactly! Okay. But then you find out, you know, those rules that mom and dad Very simple. gave me? All the mother messages, the father messages, they come back. Yes. They really weren't so bad, were they? Wow, what a good illustration. It's not perfect, please, it's not perfect. But it's a good illustration to sit there and say, you know, I don't have to live under my parents' rules anymore. But, you know, they had some good ideas. Okay? And maybe I need to adopt those ideas and follow those ideas because... They weren't so bad. They weren't so bad, you're right. But I won't tell them about it because I'd be ashamed to. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you've all been there. Okay, so anyway, so welcome to the third use of the law. Christ fulfilled them for us. And because of our love for God, because we appreciate the forgiveness of sins, it, it's like that young adult that says, you know those Ten Commandments? You know, um... If, if I don't go around killing people, you know, that, that's a good way of making friends, right? Because killing people is really a lousy way of making friends. You know, if I'm not out there stealing from other people and I'm helping them protect them, that's also a good way of making uh, friends, right? You know, so, you know, we look at these commandments and we say, yeah, they're, they're not so bad. They are a good guideline for us. Well, welcome to the third use of the law. Now, let me tell you where this dispute came from. There were actually some people that said, well, Christ fulfilled the law. Well, yes, he did. And then they want to completely eliminate the law and say, we shouldn't even talk about the law anymore. And we're like, well, well wait a minute. They are a good guideline for our daily livings. And so that's where sometimes we got into trouble or not. So that's why I put down at the bottom of this, as the formula of Concord continues, uh, it concerns, concerned whether the law is to be urged upon the reborn Christians or not. One party said yes, the other no. 
And in connection with this, uh, the formula of Concord was addressing the very similar idea, another idea that, that St. Paul had was struggling with is that you still must follow the law and you must do it perfectly. And you know, what, what did Jesus do? Didn't he fulfill the law for us? The answer is yes. And so we, we have this whole concept and this struggle going on here. So Paul is trying to teach the people in, for, in this letter to the Galatians how one becomes a Christ, Christian. Do Gentiles need to become Jewish first to fulfill the law? The answer is no. And the law should be preached as a guide for Christians, not for spiritual blackmail. You know, what do I mean by spiritual blackmail? If you don't do this, you will lose your faith. What's the unforgivable sin? Rejection of Christ. Rejection of Christ. Okay, that's the unforgivable sin, is the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, rejection of Christ. Okay, why do you have a reborn Christian then? Uh, that's the, the verbiage that um, the, the translators of the uh, Formula Concord used in this particular version, and it's in reference to a Christian, that you're reborn again. I'm a Christian. I'm reborn. Yeah. Yeah, twice. yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's just... Verbiage that says you're a Christian here. Okay, so, so faith is a gift from God. Sins are forgiven by Jesus uh, as he dies on the cross. Uh, faith receives the blessings from the cross. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord, not even your sins. I love that idea here. Your sins, God says, they're taken away. They are no longer a separation. Okay. However, you can reject the faith and you can say no to Jesus. Okay. So we use the law as a God so that we don't reject the Christian faith. And so, um, you know, again, going back to the Ten Commandments, is it helpful for my marriage if I avoid having an affair? Yes, it is helpful. Okay. Um, but now, as I go down that road, I'm not going down that road, let me rephrase that. Um, if I have an affair, does that mean that my marriage is ended? The answer is no. Is it hindered? Uh, yeah. If I keep the sixth commandment, uh, it helps my marriage. That's how we can use the law as a God in our daily living. Okay, so that's what, the, that's what the third use of the law is. Now, I will admit, Lutherans spend a lot hammering this out, okay? Uh, there are some people who want to throw out the law completely. We have a nice fancy term for them. We we'll call them antinomianists. That means basically no law. Uh, and there are some that says, that would just say, you got to still keep hammering the law upon the people. Um, wait a minute, what happened to grace, forgiveness of sins, and so forth down the line? So that's why we have uh, the third use of the law. Let's go back to uh, St. Paul in Galatians here, after my little segue here. Uh, 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So notice where he wants you to end up. He does not want you to end up in saying, I got to fulfill the law perfectly, okay? But instead, he wants you to realize you got to put on Christ because he fulfilled the law perfectly. You cannot. So a little note here from Luther here. In baptism then, it is not the garment of righteousness of the righteousness of the law or of our own works that is given, but Christ becomes our garment. But he is not the law, not the lawgiver, not a work. He is the divine and uh, inestimable gift that the Father has given to us to be our justifier, life giver, and redeemer. To put on Christ according to the gospel, therefore, is to put on 
not the law or works, but an inestimable uh, gift, namely the forgiveness of sins, righteousness, peace, comfort, joy in the Holy Spirit, salvation, life, and Christ himself. Okay, so as Christians, we put on Christ. Christ is our hope. Christ is our salvation. Okay, uh, our salvation is not going to be in the uh, law of God, but in what Christ has done to fulfill the law for us. Okay, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, why does Paul seem to be going, okay, you're, you're sitting here, you're making this whole premise here about the law and about faith in Christ, and, and now you're getting into distinctions of people here between Jew or Greek, slave and free, male or female. And the answer is that's what they were struggling with. Remember, part of their question was, did you have to become Jewish first in order to become a Christian? And so St. Paul is now going to spell it out. It doesn't matter. It's not about being Jewish or Greek. It's not mattering about whether you are a slave or whether you're a free person or you're male or female. It's all about, did you put on Christ? Is that our first amendment? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, the Constitution has its own ways of dealing with things, but uh, that's the, that Constitution here. But from Christianity's point of view, we're going to say we're all one in Christ. It doesn't matter our background. Do you believe and trust in the promises of God? Do you look to Christ and see your Savior who brings you the forgiveness of sins? And so I put in the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, as St. Paul writes, Now, meaning right now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So notice where Paul is putting us. He's not going to put us in the distinction of Jewish or Gentile or Greek or free or slave or even male or female. He's saying, guess what? You're all in the body of Christ. You have put on Christ. And it's interesting in our world that is so struggling with personal pronouns and gender identity issues, okay? And not just gender identity issues, also some racial issues and language issues. I think the Christian message is the only message that can bring healing to this world that says stop fighting amongst yourself with these gender issues and background issues and race issues you are all in Christ you are all forgiven you are children of God stop rejecting Christ believe and trust in the promises of God that's what's really going to unify us not hammering out the appropriate pronouns to be used. I know that's where our world's at today, but I love the message of Paul much better. We're all in one in Christ Jesus. We are all God's children. We are all God's children. You're right, because of the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, let's go on to verse 29. He's going to bring this up again. And if you are Christ's, okay, then you are Abraham's offspring, <clears throat> heirs according to promise. That's why I like singing that one song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you, so let's just praise the Lord. Yeah, it's kind of a fun song, and guess what? Because of our faith and trust in Christ, we are Abraham's offspring because it's not about the DNA okay it's about Abraham's trust in the promises of God you trust in the promises of God guess what we're all one in Christ that's the key 
Any questions about this? Because we're going to move into a different section next. Okay, let's uh, go back to my outline here. So now St. Paul is going to use uh, an illustration. Here. And he's much better at illustrations than I am. Uh, and he's going to use the illustration of a human error. Uh, Hair, and basically one who has received an inheritance, okay? Um, and how does that apply or relate to this Christian faith and this discussion of law and gospel? So let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So what St. Paul is talking about is uh, as a child, you know, you're going to be inheriting everything of your parents, especially if you're an only child. Okay. Uh, and but yet you don't have it yet. And you're still under the rules of the household. Okay, you still got to listen to mom and dad, okay? And so that's why he's saying, okay, he's bringing back this whole concept of the law and the guardian. Remember, this is going to be his illustration. I already gave you kind of my illustration of the household laws, rules, and then when you get your own place, you get to develop kind of your own rules, and you sometimes bring back a lot of moms and dads. Uh, but again, uh, he's, St. Paul is using this illustration. Until the date set by his father. And then his father will determine, okay, uh, this is now yours. I will give it to you. And I know very often we usually think of inheritance after the parents have died. But in this case, I think uh, the, pa uh, the father is saying, once you get to a certain age, then you can handle this responsibility and it's now yours. Okay? But that's only the good. Well, with responsibility comes good and bad, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's go on to verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. So St. Paul is going to say, guess what? You were enslaved to sin. So let's spell this out here. From John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So let's go back to Paul's words here. So Jesus kind of explains this, that yes, we're enslaved to sin. And so St. Paul is basically saying, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. Welcome to sin. Okay, uh, we needed to be redeemed from sin. We could not redeem ourselves. We needed a savior to come to fulfill the law perfectly. And that savior, oh, let me let Paul explain it. I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. So I want you, so, so Paul is setting up the premise. You were enslaved to sin. Okay, until verse four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So St. Paul set up the premise, or the beginning premise was we were enslaved to sin until Christ came. This is Paul's version of the nativity scene, so to speak, of the birth of Christ. Okay, you know, typically, you know, we always think of Luke chapter 2, okay, Matthew also has an account, okay, especially with the wise men coming, but this is kind of Paul's account, at the right time, at the right place, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law so that we could become children of God, plain and simple, love it, very quick. But I will admit, it doesn't necessarily fit very well nicely on a cover of a Hallmark uh, Christmas card. 
uh, but um, it should because it gets to the point really, really quickly. But let's p bring up uh, Luther here for a moment. Luther has a, a, an interesting way of presenting himself. So he's just going to make this declaration, so to speak. He basically says, law, so he's sort of addressing the law right now. So just think of it that way. Law, you have no jurisdiction over me. Therefore, you are accusing and condemning me in vain. For I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom the Father sent into the world to redeem us miserable sinners who are oppressed by the tyranny of the law. He poured out his life and spent it lavishly for me. When I feel your terrors and threats, O law, I immerse my conscience in the wounds, the blood, the death, the resurrection, and the victory of Christ. Beyond him, I do not want to see or hear anything at all. So again, Luther's being a little poetic here. He, he's basically almost like if he could address the convictions of the law, the law that condemns us, the law that brings that guilt, that shame upon us, the law like the skeletons rattling in our closet, I like to say. Luther has that answer. And it's these words here, it's not the law. The law will never bring you comfort. When those skeletons rattle in the closet, you're thinking, oh, the best way to handle those skeletons is to open up that closet door, right? And Luther is going to be like, no, you don't return to the law. That was the problem that St. Paul had with the Galatians. They, they probably felt their guilt, they probably felt their shame. <laughs> And what did they do? They returned back to the law. And uh, this beautiful quote here from Luther is basically saying, you don't return back to the law. I want to know nothing of the law per se, except for as a guide, I'll sort of toss in that third use of the law. I want to know Christ. So when I hear the rattling of the skeletons in my closet, when I feel the guilt and the shame and I remember my sins of my past, he says, O law, I immerse my conscience in the wounds, the blood, the death, the resurrection, and the victory of Christ beyond him, referring to Christ, I do not want to see or hear anything at all. I just need Christ. And so you're hanging on to Christ. So I love these words of Luther. Uh, and again, you just got to kind of understand them in his context. He's sort of personifying the law. But as we take a look at our own life and how many times we've allowed guilt and shame to manipulate us and make us feel more guilty, Luther is like, no, look at Christ. Know that your sins are forgiven. Okay, so let's get back to uh, St. Paul here. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And because you are sons... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Remember, being a slave to sin, being haunted by the skeletons in the closet, being, you know, enslaved to the guilt, the shame, of your sin and as Luther would say no I want to see Christ so because you are sons you now have the spirit that we can cry out Abba Father no longer a slave but now a child of God an heir through God and so that's his little illustration there of saying yes we are forgiven the accusing of the law is fulfilled in Christ. Now we get the opportunity, third use of the law, to use the law in our daily lives because we are free. We got our own place now. We get to pet, sort of, so to speak. 
But again, it, 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 that's a failed illustration. But again, it's that idea here. The law does not accuse. Christ fulfilled the law. Now we can use the law as a guide. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, the next section here. Okay, well now we're going to be uh, changing directions a little bit. We're dealing now with the third argument here about receiving justification and a, an appeal to uh, a shared past. And we're going to be picking up point number one, what the Galatians were before faith. That's huge. Remember, faith and once you become a child of God, things change. Before faith, you're under the law. The law is showing you your sins, okay? Uh, but now that you're in Christ, you are forgiven. So now let's go into what St. Paul has to say for us. Verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Ooh, let's have a little fun with this one. Before we were talking about ins being enslaved to sin. Now he's saying you were enslaved by those, uh, to those that by nature are not gods. That's why I'm bringing my, one of my favorite passages. I know you probably have heard me say this, quote this passage so many times. From Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember, God is speaking to the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Who were we enslaved to? We were enslaved to the devil. That's what Paul is trying to refer to in Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. Because of our sin. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, they ate that forbidden fruit. They weren't supposed to. They became friends with the devil, so to speak. And so the promise of God, of a Savior, was going to be, I'm going to take that relationship between the devil and humanity, and I'm going to now make you enemies. Because right now you're friends. We were friends with the devil. But now through Christ, we, can, we are now enemies of the devil. Thanks be to God. Okay? So we shouldn't be surprised, as Jesus says, that the world hates us. Yeah, 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 it hates us because it hated Jesus first, as uh, the Gospel of writer John uh, reminds us. So getting back to Paul here in Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. The devil isn't God. Okay? The devil does not know your thoughts. God knows your heart. The devil doesn't, okay? The devil is trying to tempt you to give up God. Fair enough, okay? But the devil is not Almighty God. Some, we live in this world where sometimes people th sit there and think, well, you know, there's good and there's bad in this world. There's a, a good God and then there's a devil, so to speak, and they have, like, equal power. No, 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 no. St. Paul clarifies that very click, quickly here in verse 8. You were enslaved to sin, you were enslaved to the devil, but guess what? The devil really isn't God. There is only one God, and he is the one that's going to break you free of the devil. But let's go on, uh, uh, verse 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of this world whose slaves you want to be once more? You want to return back to that slavery of sin? That's what St. Paul is begging that question here. You have been set free by Christ. This is why I like to call this this spiritual blackmail here that you know if you keep on pro uh preaching the law the law the law the law okay not as a guide okay but you got to fulfill the law otherwise you're not a good christian i call that that spiritual blackmail notice what i did to the cross of christ i destroyed it okay Christ died for the forgiveness of all my sins. He fulfilled the law. 
Now I use the law as a guide. No spiritual blackmail anymore. <clears throat> My sins are forgiven. Let me bring up Luther here. Uh, this is the exact same uh, quote from before, but I just want to go back to it again. Remember, the reason why, let me go back to it, is St. Paul is begging this question. How can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of this world? So I think we need to hear this word of Luther again, where he's basically going after the law. He's personifying the law, and he says, Law, you have no jurisdiction over me. Therefore, you are accusing and condemning me in vain. See, that's the answer that the Galatians needed to hear. For I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom the Father sent into the world to redeem us, miserable sinners who are oppressed by the tyranny of the law. He poured out his life and spent it lavishly for me. I like that, that poetic idea of he, he spent it lavishly uh, for me. Um, when I feel your terrors and threats, O law, I immerse my conscience in the wounds, the blood, the death, the resurrection, and the victory of Christ. Beyond him, I do not want to see or hear anything at all. With these words of Luther, I want to end here at this point just because it's at, ending at such a good point. And just want you to end in that beautiful grace that Luther is trying to point out for us. So let's close with the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.